right, we have 25 minutes, so we're going to get going. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today we have an interesting topic, uh, and an interesting panel to discuss the topic um, about OCP adoption. Uh, my name is Amir Michael. I am Vice President of Infrastructure Engineering at Salesforce and uh, founder of the Open Compute Project, one of the many founders of the Open Compute Project. Uh, and uh, I've had an uh, interesting time over the last eight years seeing how the project's evolved, uh, been able to see uh, the differences in the industry from where we were in 2011 till today. And we'll be talking about some of those things today on the panel. So why don't we go ahead and invite up the panelists. Uh, we'll start off uh, by introducing Doug Bone from uh, Hive Solutions. And Mohan Kumar from Intel. I just found out an interesting tidbit. Mohan's been at Intel for 25 years. Uh, Charles Ngal is from Baidu. And Mike Moore from Nokia. All right, so we'll kick this off, and, and I'll, I'll tell a bit of a story before we, we begin, which will lead into our first question. But uh, when we started OCP um, back in 2010 is when we did the first designs, there weren't a lot of solutions that were really designed for a scale out in the industry. And so that was the reason why OCP was really formed, was because companies were out looking for these solutions, couldn't really find things that worked at scale. And Facebook at the time decided that they just needed to go and build their own. The world's changed since then. Uh, I joined Salesforce about a year and a half ago and was faced with a lot of the same challenges and, and, and um, opportunities that I had when I was at Facebook. Only the industry had changed. And as we went out and started looking for scale-out solutions to help with our infrastructure, we were quite surprised to find that a lot of the things that we were looking for uh, back when I was at Facebook exist in the industry today. And so there's been a migration from what used to once be reserved for hyperscale, large-scale operators into products that you can now find into the industry today. And so that leads into our, our first question is, what are those, those key elements from the server architecture that over the years, through a lot of exposure through OCP, have actually found themselves into some of the products that you're able to find on the market today? Well, uh, in, in my view, some of the key advances that have become more popular have been things like front I.O. for serviceability, uh, things like fixed internal drives. I know that that, that was something that was very hard to acquire uh, uh, in commercial products back then, and I think that's become more of a more of a, a viable option for flexible server design. And I think the other thing, which was something which is OCP really highlighted on the efficiency side, is the importance of efficient motherboard design. Because I think uh, previously people thought of efficiency mostly as a function of the power supply and really neglected to optimize the efficiency characteristics of the motherboard. And I think that there's a lot of designs now that are much more efficient because of the popularization of that through OCP. Excellent. Yeah, yeah um, for, from Nokia, we actually uh, offer a, a fully integrated uh, open rack version two based uh, rack, you know, fully racked and stacked for our, mostly designed for our telco customers. And yeah, I can certainly mirror the, or, or, or echo the, the comment on the front IO. You know, it, basically the you know, open rack really embraces a lot of the tenants of OCP as far as toolless design. Uh, ease of operations, uh, you know, vanity-free design, but especially that that front uh, maintenance is something that really appeals to the customers when they're looking at TCO and the the actual cost of of you know doing uh, you know basic maintenance operations. You know, we've actually done side-by-side -side comparisons of rack mount versus open rack, and you know most uh, maintenance operations are about four times faster using open rack versus. Uh, you know, versus rack mount. Yeah, um, I also want to talk a little bit about things that are beyond as the only as the representative software for Mirga in this in this panel. Uh, there are things that OCP has brought in, like uh, you know the open firmware and open BMC and so on, that have you know enhanced the platform experience for the entire world. I think by you know being the central place for innovation to happen. 
Yep. So what I'm hearing are, are things that help on the operational side, big piece of it, right? As you have scale, more and more servers, tens of thousands of servers, those are big wins because those get multiplied across them. At the same time, uh, there were a number of things that came out, especially with the first revision of OCP, um, that weren't as, as successful, didn't gain as much adoption, right? And some of them still exist uh, within the large-scale operators today and haven't quite trickled down to the, to the adopters of OCP. A couple that, that come to mind, well, there, there's one interesting one. In, in the first revision of OCP, we did a triplet rack. And it had three columns of servers lined up, welded together, uh, and you had to roll in three racks at a time, more or less. That was really heavy. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was uh, especially a challenge when you wanted to fill them up with disks. Um, and so that one has, has since gone by the wayside for particular reasons. There are other things that are still valid today. Uh, for example, localized UPS systems. Um, those are, are things that are perhaps harder to adopt, but uh, you know, as this room is filled with both uh, adopters and solution providers, right, uh, may still be valid. And I think it's important to talk about, hey, what are these other technologies that people can benefit efficiencies from? Are there opportunities to help introduce them into, into the market? Any other thoughts around why it is first to adopt things like localized battery? Any thoughts around how that you can gain traction around the, those, those types of uh, adoptions? Or any other things within OCP that perhaps didn't quite make the cut either? Yeah. I think as far as the, uh, the battery adoption, m most of our installations have been going into Brownfield data centers. So you know, they already have a, you know, a, a, you know, a UPS infrastructure set up. But I really think as we begin to move OCP more toward the edge, into more greenfield deployments, that's where something like battery backup is really going to start to gain popularity. Yeah. I think we're also still missing the boat a little bit on optimizing at the data center level. Because people talk about optimizing at the server level and optimizing at the rack level. A lot of the promise of OCP is still bringing efficiency all the way back to the data center design and bringing, say, 480 volt power unconditioned directly into the rack. I mean, most of the installations today still have a lot of what I would call sort of legacy power distribution thinking. And even when we move to power distribution in the rack, which is obviously a big advantage, and the backup batteries, there's still a lot of things that are usually less than optimal, you know, unless you're at scale building a lot of data centers, you know, uh, from scratch. So I think that's an area where we can continue to, to uh, uh, innovate and to educate and to provide products that, that will help in that regard also. So, so are those things just reserved for large scale operators? Are there opportunities to bring them in downstream? Well, I think there are because, uh, I mean, even small operators, and usually people are in this room are probably not operating at a, at a small level, but someone builds the data center. So even if one company isn't building a data center for themselves, you're still having someone building a data center for a variety of tenants, yep. and there's no reason why a lot of the design elements can't be incorporated into at least a portion of those facilities. So last year, I think, was the first, last year was the time that they introduced Lightning was contributed, right? I mean, things that are disaggregating storage naturally bring this problem now because now you're not in one, one block where you could put in your UPS or whatever, whatever you needed to design. That disaggregation means the protection of the data starts at wherever the first entity, which is a compute entity now. And now I think that will allow us, I mean, it just got reintroduced one year ago, there's not enough for adoption to happen quickly. So as it gets adopted, people will realize that there is a problem and there is a solution waiting for them as well. Okay. Now, I've noticed there, there could be other entry points uh, into OCP, not necessarily from servers. Uh, there's things like networking, things like firmware um, related to open BMC. Do you have any experience with those being sort of the entry point, the first, the first taste of OCP that leads people to want to adopt more? Are there, how does that compare to just entry points with servers? Right. I, I can easily see that. I mean, OpenBMC is still emerging, but I can easily see where um, having access to that openness in the server platform allows you to come in and enter this market and uh, you know, produce a product as, as, a, as a vendor. Uh, because you, know, you need you need to have, I, I think what's what's happening is that essentially there is a solution mindset now at OCP which is awesome because it's not just I'm giving you a server I'm giving you a, a Gerber file or anything like that I'm giving you the whole thing that can be built into a platform and put into production that's what having an open firmware allows you to do what open BMC allows you to do 
right? And uh, and this is it's a, it's a great trend. I mean, I would say that on the uh, in a similar vein, the networking products provide a really good solution for a lot of people, and I think that as much as we've made advances in the in the servers and the rack level, probably what's happened with top of rack switches is even more exciting. Uh, in terms of adoption, though, it's kind of interesting because. I think a lot of people are very set in their ways in terms of how they implement networking. Mm -hmm. So you probably have half of the customers where um, OCP type networking is probably going to be the last thing they're going to put in their data center. And probably you have another half of the customers, a little bit of a simplification, but the other half of the customers are probably going to put it in first because it provides a lot of value and cost savings and TCO advantages. So it's kind of interesting that I think in terms of networking, it's probably going to be something where you're either a very early adopter or it's the last thing that gets changed in the, in the rack. Got and it. that might be a little bit of a simplification, but I think there's probably more truth to that than, than not. Yeah. And I think the ma majority of the customers that I'm working with today, at least, they're on the other side of that. Networking will probably be the last thing that they go you know, open with, you know, they want, uh, you know, they typically have their, their own switch vendors that they've selected and they prefer to have integrated. And so, the, you know, the opening for us is really in the hardware side of things to, or, or in the, uh, should I say, in the compute and the storage side of things and the rack to, you know, to introduce OCP. Yeah, and that's okay. I mean, uh, OCP provides a lot of solutions for a lot of things. And if it's not appropriate for someone, they can use the ones that, that are good for them. And I think we have to remember that. It's, it's open for a reason, so people can adopt it or not, depending on you know, how it helps them. And I think for most customers, they'll eventually, users, they'll eventually figure out that a lot of it helps them in a lot of ways. But if they don't view it that way, they don't have to adopt the open BMC or the open storage. You know, they can pick and choose. Are there any that are coming specifically for the software innovations, either on the switching side or on the management side? Is that a primary driver, or have you not seen that? I think for us, at least, uh, you know, our customers show a lot of interest in Redfish and the potential of, of you know, of that API, uh -huh. you know, especially when it comes to being able to, uh, you know, create scripts that will work across multiple vendor platforms. You know, I think there's a, there's a lot of promise there. Right. So that's one of the key things about, you know, I mean, so some of these transformations, uh, interestingly, happen in uh, step functions. And Redfish is one of those things where you're moving from inherently binary oriented protocol to a HTTP text oriented protocol that you know immediately human consumable I mean these are you may think of them as you know small trivial changes but they have a big impact on the usability of the product so very excited about the direction on open BMC and the fact that OCP is throw, throwing its weight behind redfish yep. all right I'm gonna shift gears a little bit uh, specifically to China when we think about OCP or infrastructure in general, you don't specifically think about it as having geographical boundaries. But uh, there is something, uh, an organization in China called ODCC. Um, there are standards that they're working on as well, um, specifically around some around 48 volts. I was wondering, Charles, if you could first tell us a little bit about what is ODCC and any tie-ins with OCP. OK, so ODCC is a, stands for Open Data Center Committee. Um, it's a it's a, a standards committee that uh, operates out of uh, China. Um, I would say that a, a lot of the end state goals are are, are fairly similar. Um, do you also see some elements uh, of oh, um, the benefits of OCP and ODC products? So, for example, you'll see a modular DC bus in the rack. Um, OCP has some differences in that there's actually even a modular cooling system as part of the rack. So. Um, so I think you know as we move into the the, the, the future. I mean, this, uh, the the 48 volt is something that's been uh, uh, worked on, developed for, for quite some time by some members of OCP, and um, it's something that Baidu's explored, and and uh, and and we we feel there's a, a, a good solution space. Um, certainly, as time progresses, as more um, as the uh, so I say the supply chain. For 48 volt becomes more mature, we're seeing a very strong uh, value proposition. In, in, right now, it's maybe some narrow verticals, but we feel that over time it will be it will become more spread out. So there'll be there'll be a very strong value propositions and even the the, uh, the most diverse of platforms. So uh, so that's an area where there's a lot of a lot of work and a lot of research, and and we're pretty strongly engaged with with uh, a lot of the suppliers 
of, the, of this 48-volt uh, technology. Got it. So it sounds like there's a rack standard uh, across ODCC consumers. Right, right. So those, they're just like you see in OCP, there's, there'll be some standard for the 48-volt. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And then how about for the, one, one of the challenges with 48-volt adoption is points of load or actually devices to plug into it. Is there focus around that with ODCC? Um, yeah, so, so when we say like narrow vertical space, it, 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 the, the biggest benefit comes from high power density. Right. right? And this is not something that traditionally the uh, OCP or ODCC is a, a space that this really high density platforms has excelled at, right? Sure. But, mm -hmm. but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, as we, as we progress to 48 volts, these are the, this is the reality, right? We're dealing with much higher density systems and, uh, and we're doing the engineering to accommodate that. Yep, excellent. Um, next topic is slightly different, not as technical. Um, coming to a new company like, like I have, um, there's obviously interesting things uh, um, from both the technical side and the supply chain side that would want to drive someone to use OCP, but there's also a lot of uh, legacy and, and, and um, uh, practices that companies have built in. Having a room full of solution providers, end users, all of them at some level interested in OCP, perhaps wanting to adopt, Aside from the technical part of it, what are some of the other challenges that people may face either politically, organizationally, within their companies in order to bring in OCP? Or any that you've experienced as someone selling into them, into uh, customers, or as a customer yourself being able to adopt? Well, I think from Nokia's side, we have, uh, you know, we, we sell a fully integrated solution. Right. You know, we, we've selected, you know, the racks, we've designed the servers, the storage, um, you know, the switching, and <clears throat> really cabled it, optimized for a telco workload. However, you, there are some customers out there that they have separate organizations, you know, one that specifies the rack, one that specifies the server, one that specifies, you know, the, the, the power and the, and the networking. And so, you know, the, the challenge to us with, with some of these customers is really bringing them all together to agree that the solution that we're providing is really the best one for them. Yeah, and I think along the same veins, uh, OCP works well when you buy multiple parts of it, right? You don't buy OCP servers and then not have a rack to put them in, right? So there's always a number of different things that have to be integrated, and the solutions are synergistic, yep. in, in the more that you adopt, the easier the integration is. So when customers, for political reasons or you know departmental reasons, are not willing to adopt all aspects of the solution, then you come into issues of, well, we love OCP servers, but we have to connect them to traditional storage and use certain switches with different rack types. And I think that presents a barrier. I mean, you said non-technical. It's kind of technical, but it's also essentially sort of a uh, an organizational standard where different things are not adopted at the same time. Sure. And I think it's, it's difficult sometimes to, for a customer to transfer all aspects of their infrastructure to OCP simultaneously, mm -hmm. and that makes the rollout you know, a little more challenging. Yep. yep. So back to the telcos, I think the, it's an interesting use case. If you think about OCP, the initial, call it seven years or so, we're focused on scale out. Right, large-scale data centers. Uh, there's a, a brand new project within OCP, not brand new, but for, for I'd say about two years, focusing just uh, on telcos. Um, and the use case is different, and it's new to a lot of people who are used to the scale outside. Um, do you mind talking a little bit about how the telcos operate? How is that different uh, than what you might find on scale out? Yeah, well, the, I think the you know, when we adopted OpenRack version 2 as our, really as our reference platform for, for Telco Cloud, you know, there were, you know, while it's a, it's a, you know, it's a fantastic platform, there were certain deficiencies in it that our, uh, you know, our Telco operators insist on. And these are things like, uh, you know, negative 48 volt power to allow them to go into existing central offices, EMI shielding, uh, NES, NEB seismic zone 4 earthquake protection, and, and so, you know, these were all things that had to be added to the existing rack in order to create a solution that they would even allow into their data center. And so, you know, that's the one thing that, that Nokia has been doing and that we are, you know, working to contribute back to the, uh, back to the community is basically these, uh, you know, these NEBS level telco grade enhancements. So did you design a new rack or did you take existing designs and modify that? 
And we actually have an existing rack that we've designed a, a, a bolt-on NEBS, uh, you know, a seismic kit for. And, uh, you know, as far as the, the EMI shielding, we've actually integrated that into our server design itself. Okay. Right. And then the negative 48 volt, you know, that's an existing, uh, you know, or a, a, a PDU module, and it still supplies, you know, the 12 volt to the, you know, to the common power rail. So you've done, not only did you do a rack kit, you did customized servers with EMI shielding, and then also ripped out the power shelves with their AC conversion and did a DC to DC conversion in them? Well, yeah, so we've, uh, you, know, cust you know, we have customers all over the world, and yeah. you know, obviously power standards vary from, from region to region, and you know, some regions actually have multiple power standards all within the same region. So you know, it's basically been a, a mission for us to develop uh, you know, solutions that will go anywhere in the world, right? Whether it's, it's negative 48 DC, you know, high voltage DC, 208 three phase AC like you get here in the US or, you know, or, you know 400, 415 that you typically see in the rest of the world. Yeah, interesting. That, that's a lot of different use cases. Um, okay, so uh, that's a great example of taking something in OCP, something that's open, design files, being able to modify them for a particular use case. I've seen some interesting hacks of OCP hardware, adding uh, um, everything from, from projects we've had at uh, former hackathons here at the summit, people adding flash into what is typically a, a spinning drive carrier, for example. Any other examples of interesting or creative uh, adaptations of OCP designs that have allowed them to operate in different types of environments? Uh, good question, but none, none come to mind right now. <laughs> but uh, certainly it is a, a big advantage of the platform to be able to mm -hmm. leverage things. Uh, I think it's more common for people to adopt OCP principles in non-OCP projects, but obviously, uh, you know, you know, from just what you were talking about, obviously you can do the extensions within the OCP project itself also. Yep. But no examples come to mind off the top of my head. Yep. I, I have maybe one that, that comes to mind. We, uh, as, as far as the environment goes, you know, we, I, we have, uh, you know, several tier one customers here in the U.S., you know, one commercially deploying, you know, the other two are kind of kicking the tires on it right now. And, and one of our customers actually has uh, the OCP deployed in a uh, container data center you know, sitting out in their parking lot. Sure. And, you know, going in and monitoring the temperature during the summer, I'd regularly see the temperature well above 35C, not well above, around 35C, but just saying that, that the, you know, the, the improved heat sinks, the, the, the you know, the, the more efficient fans, the airflow design of, of open rack really allows it to, you know, to operate in environments that, you know, traditional servers might have, uh, might have struggles. Yep. So more more edge based use cases are you're able to solve them with OCP. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And I think from the open uh, data center standpoint as well, you, you can see a lot of the, you know, the, the, the similar principles to OCP being apl applied into practice, and, um, and and this is you know, it it's, it, it helps them achieve a solution that's particular for the data center operators in China that may not match precisely what the requirements are uh, elsewhere, right? So so but the but the principles are there. And the in-state goals are also similar. Yep, excellent. Great, thank you. So we're running close to the end of time, uh, and there's another talk here in a few minutes. Uh, so I want to take this opportunity, first of all, to invite anyone who has questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time during the session for questions. We can hang out outside in front of the room. Uh, and feel free to <laughs> engage our, our panelists, and then to thank our panelists and all of you for coming to participate. Thank you very much. And thank you, Amir. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure.